Not a fun night if you are a fan of the New York Knicks. They fall 116 to 103 in Indiana, setting up a do or die game seven. We talk about Josh Hart's health, Jalen Brunson's struggles, a big night for Deuce McBride, and if the Knicks have anything left in the tank. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for joining us on Locked On Knicks. Gavin Shaw, XJ, uh, teaming up to take you through what was a miserable Game 6 for the New York Knicks. Uh, shout out to all the Knicks content creators who had it in them to to do a podcast or write an article last night. I didn't. Uh, I, I honestly did not have it in me. Um, so we are recording uh, Saturday morning. By the time you guys are listening, maybe, maybe uh, late Saturday morning. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in for what is hopefully somewhat of a therapy session Maybe maybe a little doom and gloom because I, I just feel like the Knicks do better when, when I'm negative about them and I give up and I, I give them yet another doubter um, to go against. Um, but before we get rolling on that, I want to remind you that LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown MBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. I wanted to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day because we are now available on all platforms and that includes on YouTube. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, that notifications bell to uh, make sure you don't miss an episode on the YouTube side and then the auto download function on your favorite podcast platform of choice. I mentioned it already, but I am Gavin Shaw, uh, your favorite player by play broadcaster's favorite play by play broadcaster. He is XJ, the co host of the Hot hand theory podcast that did a great episode uh post game five you can still check it out reminder of some fonder times um uh, because xj this uh this is the third time i'm saying it in two minutes this was not a lot of fun josh hart getting hurt early in this game um the knicks as is their want uh no matter what the injury is it is it is termed soreness initially um so we really have no idea seemed like some kind of muscle strain i mean maybe even a hernia issue um but he was holding um his left abdomen Pretty much from five minutes in through the rest of the game, was not himself attacking the basket, um, was a disaster in this game um, defensively while trying to gut it out. Um, ESPN Stats and Info um, put out that Indiana shot 14 of 20 uh, when Josh Hart was the primary defender. That is 70% on 20 shots. That is not good. Um, and Pascal Siakam uh, got into a great rhythm um, inside on Josh Hart that led to him raining some jump shots that led to the Knicks double teaming that eventually led to the Knicks switching Isaiah Hartenstein onto Siakam in the second half. And that led to Indiana basically um, getting every offensive rebound from that point forward. And uh, that combined with Jalen Brunson ice cold in the first half, the Knicks did not have much of a chance to win this game and things at least on paper are looking somewhat dire heading into game seven. Yeah, Gavin, you you summarized it all in in a beautiful fashion, in in, in, such, in such a sad and poetic way. I, I was, was going to say, I'm surprised you didn't like close out and be like, you know, screw you, man. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> you know what? You know what? No, I think I think we can mourn this loss is what we can do, and then we can look forward because I don't think, and I said this to you previously in the first episode that we did together this week. I don't think all hope is lost. I don't think all hope is lost, no matter how bad it looks right now. But the the game that we just saw was brutal. There's no way around it. Siakam attacking early. Um, I just remember thinking very early in the game before it was clear that Josh Hart was injured. I'm like, this Josh Hart is playing awful. He's just playing awfully. I I don't I, I was thinking immediately and I was live tweeting this throughout the game. Maybe we should be talking about Precious instead of playing over Deuce McBride in the starting lineup. Uh, Precious playing over Josh Hart in the starting lineup. And it's not something I would want to go to, but just given how he looked, given how they were attacking him, and given how successful they were, you just read off the stats, which was being conveyed live <laughs> early in the game as well. I was like, this is not Josh Hart's night. Maybe it's a Precious night. Maybe Precious comes in to help slow down Siakam and the Knicks can do a little damage that way. But then it becomes revealed that Josh Hart is injured. And I don't know if he got injured, at what point he was injured, if he was already feeling bothered by the strain and, and it was exacerbated by, you know, stretching and jumping for some rebounds. It's not clear to me, but either way, 
this is a big problem. This is a big problem. Um, Josh Hart is a key member of the team. If he's not able to defend aggressively, if he's not able to be physical at the point of attack or physical down low with a guy like Siakam, if he's not able to dive in and extend to get insane offensive rebounds, as we know that he does, not only is it a problem if he doesn't play, it's a problem if he does play because we may be seeing a limited Josh Hart and a limited Josh Hart is just – he needs every little extra bit of juice that he has because that's what his game is predicated on. It's having that little bit more extra juice than everybody else on the court. And if he doesn't have that, it's it becomes very concerning. So even if he's healthy, I, I, I'm worried about the Josh Hart situation. The transition defense for the Knicks, it was – it was good at first. I remember writing this note down like, wow, they're getting back. They're getting matched up. And then, and then it wasn't, <laughs> it was, it was good for a second. And then it wasn't um, part of that was Josh Hart. Part of that was the Knicks just having difficulty getting matched up. But to be honest, we talked about this before playoff games are disproportionately blowouts. They're blowouts way more often than regular season games. We see teams not let their foot off the gas. They keep pushing forward when they're up 15, instead of kind of letting their foot off the gas and letting the other team get back in the game, they go up 30 oftentimes. And that's what we saw in this game. That's what we saw in the three previous games, blowouts, blowouts, blowouts. This doesn't make me feel that all hope is lost. The Josh Hart situation is very concerning for game seven, but here we are. I mean, we we, we got to cover what was going on and and also look forward. So I, that's that's kind of my initial thoughts on the game. Yeah, look, I mean, a lot of times logic just doesn't apply to this Knicks team. Like we we, we talked about our, our buddy DJ Zulo like over and over again using the phrase critical mass. Like it, it feels like if, if, if Jalen Brunson can just be on the court, like there might be no such thing as for, for this Knicks team's critical mass, at least against the Indiana Pacers, against the Boston Celtics. That might be a different story, but New York's been a different team this entire series in, in New York and Indiana, like give, give them credit. Like I, I may be guilty, but I haven't done a lot of it. Like they've been fantastic on, on their home floor and, and the Knicks were, were obviously extraordinarily depleted. Once Josh Hart was out there at maybe, I don't know, 50%, if you want to call it that, even that, sounds generous even um they took advantage of it and they they played exceptionally hard they played super connected Tyrese Halliburton was more confident Pascal Siakam that was one of the better games I've ever seen him play and and it helped that he got to go against Tart who wasn't 100 percent but he was like passing the ball really well he was shooting the ball exceptionally well like it wasn't just the post game but um the the transition defense was that that that's where my mind went like like re-watching the first half this morning I I I, I give up a lot for you guys that that may be most of all that I rewatch the first half of this game. But um, like really early on this game, Siakam gets a wide open layup because Hart is back, but just not focused and, and, and like staring at Tyrese Halliburton and Siakam just sort of snuck behind him and he ended up getting a layup off of that. Um, oh, this wasn't in transition, but in the half court, like I almost think about this in the same context that I think about transition, like just lack of focus on closeouts, like three different times on Andrew Nemhard, who is just not a great three-point shooter. The Knicks allowed blow-bys and let him get easy shots around the basket. Like, um, Hart, like, got totally torched on one, and that might have been an injury thing where he couldn't just flip his hips fast enough. I Hart, like, who, who like, at his size, like, cannot close out over-aggressively on a guard. Like, he got blown by. Um, and then Hartenstein, like, Hartenstein was guilty on a lot of these. Like, really sloppy footwork, like Miles Turner, just blow by him for a dunk. Precious Achua, who we were talking about, like blew me away in game five with how focused he was defensively, um, was guarding Siakam. And he lets Andrew Nemhard, who's like five, six inches shorter than him, like screen him out of the play and, and let Siakam switch on to DiVincenzo. When Siakam on the wing, like you can just go under that screen every single time. And instead, it's just Siakam drawing a foul on Dante DiVincenzo. Like the, my point is the Knicks were in a hole and they just, they didn't make their life any easier um with how they were playing defensively and the lack of focus they were playing with defensively but but to me like heart is the crux of that where like if he is not flying around if he is not able to help if he is not able to just physically battle pascal siakam and force him to take tough fadeaways which he's done a good job doing i said um in in the last podcast i did with tony east like even though siakam had pretty decent box score stats like especially through three quarters heart played fantastic defense on him it just was not there tonight um, I went to uh, where, where I always go after an injury now on um, Brian Suter's YouTube channel, and he did not sound particularly confident that um, whatever the specific injury for Hart, 
that either he was going to play in game seven or if he is out there, um, that he's not going to look 100%. We can get into Jalen Brunson's night because obviously like his lack of efficiency in the first half, a career high, 11 straight missed shots was, was a substantial factor, XJ. But if the Knicks don't have heart, like is that – actually one injury too many and like I'm, I'm with you like I you just have the feeling no oh, like to, to quote Nick Nurse like nothing matters like it's going to be a close game down the stretch it's going to come down to who makes big plays but like y- you get to that point you're like like is just is there is there enough here the Knicks will win game seven Gavin um the Knicks will win game seven with whatever they got I, the, the only thing I'd be concerned about to be honest with you well obviously there's a lot to be concerned about the main yeah. thing I'd be concerned about is Josh Hart trying to gut through an injury and being as ineffective as he was uh, in this most recent game? So I I really think if he just is not able to be himself, it's better for the Knicks if he just doesn't play. And that sounds crazy because they'll b- basically be down to a six-man rotation. Um, but at the same time, I think they can do a lot of good things in a one-game situation. I kind of like the Knicks in that situation, just given their grit, given what we saw from them the last time they were at MSG. And to be honest, these teams played very differently when they're at home versus on the road. And we've seen that come through loud and clear. Um, something that I also noticed in this game, and I really like that you mentioned about the transition stuff, because that was a big factor to me. Um, the pressure has been really bothering the Knicks, the full court pressure. Um, have you ever seen Gavin? We, we we're, we've been watching the Knicks for years, so we know, we're very familiar with a guy named Obi Toppin. Have you ever seen Obi Toppin pick up full court pressure? I've never seen it. I don't know about you. He was pu- putting up full court pressure, and every single pacer was instructed: whenever a Nick is bringing up the ball, do not let them bring it up easily. Make them fight to get up the court, and that's what they were doing every single time. The Knicks tried to match that pressure with fewer players who are more gassed. They, the Pacers very smartly seem to be setting up a war of attrition that the Knicks are set up to lose because they have fewer players, because they're under much more duress and stress, and they have been over the last I mean, several games throughout the playoffs. Um, but at the same time, that would suggest that, okay, well, there's this war of attrition and the Knicks don't have the, the players to do it and the Pacers are deeper and so they can handle it. I think that the Knicks have enough. I think the Knicks have enough with Isaiah Hardenstein being able to bring back what we saw from him in game five, um, with Jalen Brunson being able to bring back what we saw from him in game five. I honestly think that we could see a situation, and maybe this is something we'll talk about later. Uh, we see a situation, especially if Josh Hart doesn't play in game seven, where Alec Burks is the one who takes his spot as opposed to Precious Achua, and we have a true spacing lineup, something that we haven't seen. We've talked about spacing a lot. And we've seen, you know, pseudo spacing lineups, I'll say, with Josh Hart playing at the four. But, you know, Josh Hart's a sort of reluctant shooter, although he's shooting great from three in this postseason. He's still sort of a reluctant shooter. If you have Alec Burks out there, you have a real four out lineup with with Isaiah Hartenstein being able to operate from outside of the, the, the top of the key. So I think we could see some really good things. And I think the Knicks will be able to pull together whatever they have left for one game situation at home. I do think they'll be able to get past the Pacers just barely, but yeah, tough situation, obviously. And, and you make such great points. I'm, I'm just feel bad for you that you had to rewatch that game this morning. Cause I certainly did not. <laughs> I, I appreciate your optimism. Um, I, I was thinking about the Burks thing and I was like, no, that's too crazy. They're not going to do that. But maybe, you know, if Josh Hart's out, you you almost kind of have to. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Jalen Brunson's night. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll try to give you mostly from XJ, not so much from me, a little bit more therapy. Uh, it was an awful game six for the New York Knicks. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. I've had such good experiences on LinkedIn. Um, It's kind of this amazing network where stuff comes around to you that you never really saw coming. Like I, I connected with someone who worked at the NFL a year after me. And like, I never really met before. And it ended up leading to a job at CBS sports that like went beyond my wildest dreams, got to fly out, uh, cover a UCLA, Oregon basketball game, got to be in the production truck. 
it was super duper cool for someone who wants to one day be broadcasting for a company like CBS. And it only happened because I was connected with someone on LinkedIn. I was posting my stuff. They saw it. They liked it. And LinkedIn is kind of the one place that happens because it's not just another job board. They're a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all that will make the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have so many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. 2.5 million small businesses are using LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown MBA. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, XJ, let's let us let us let's talk through that that Alec Burks idea. I want to I want to circle around to this game, but in all honesty, I really don't. Um, so let's let let's look ahead a little bit more, and then we'll we'll, we'll come back. Um, I was thinking about that, and I was like, do you just try to outscore them at a certain point? And like where I where that like gives me like a icky feeling in my stomach is this game against the Pacers. I talked a lot early season on this podcast. Like I remember lost to the Celtics opening night, then second game against the Pelicans and how the Knicks just felt small. I mean, it, it was like that when they played the, the apex version of the Clippers on, on the road as well before the Ananobi trade. And they'd be in these games where they'd be competing, they'd be playing well. And you just had this, this uncharacteristic feeling after what they did to the Cavs in last year's playoffs, where they were the bullies that, there just wasn't enough collective size on the perimeter and like teams were shooting over them and offensive rebounding on them. And, 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 and the Knicks were just too beat up to close out games in the fourth quarter. And, and even Jalen Brunson at times was, was, was bothered by excessive length and excessive help. And this Pacers game felt like a gross reversion to that, but just watching like Aaron Neesmith and miles Turner, run a pick and roll. And like Neesmith is not like a particularly great playmaker, but it was like Jalen Brunson guarding him. And I think it might've been, um, I'm trying to remember who's guarding Turner. It it might've, it might've even been Hardenstein at that point, but they just felt bigger than the Knicks on that. And like the play where like Pascal's posting up and the Knicks have to double him. And then Turner's like ducking in for this monster dunk. And you're like, Oh my goodness. Like this team, like we don't, we don't have business beating this team right now because they are just too big too athletic and they're playing harder and faster on top of it. And that is where, like, that is my fear with having Burks out there. I think, I think DJ posted the, the rebounding stats in the second half. So I did the switch in the second half They put um, Hartenstein on Siakam. And in the first half, when Siakam was on the floor, the Pacers rebound 40% of their misses. That was with Siakam guarded by Hart. That jumped to 70% in the second half when the Knicks made the switch to put the center on Siakam. So I guess the long winded question I would pose to you is like if the Knicks go that way and they go all offense. And I I love what that would, because it just kind of nullifies the adjustment the Pacers made in the second quarter of this game, which was to take Tyrese Halliburton off of Deuce McBride, put him on Josh Hart, cut off that, that uh, screen and, and dive game where they would trap Brunson and the Knicks were just torching them. And if Hart's healthy, obviously he's capable of doing that, but not healthy. He's not. Um, you, you can't do that if the Knicks get the four out spacing. So in that sense, I love it. My fear is like, are the Knicks just going to get pulverized on the glass and it's going to be a version of what we saw the Knicks do to the Pacers in game five? Yeah, it's a great question and a legitimate concern. A couple of things here. So one, I, I don't necessarily think the Knicks will start with that lineup. I, I, I mean, I'll say I, I know the Knicks won't start with that lineup. The Knicks will yeah. start with Precious Sichu at the four, Isaiah Hartenstein at the five. Um, that being said, uh, I think that this gives them an option to go to. And part of the issue is that I think that they need to make the Pacers play defense and they need to make the, they need to make Tyrese Halliburton play defense. They did early and Halliburton kind of showed that he was a little bit up for the task, but, and then they kind of went away from it. I don't think you go away from it. I think you keep putting Tyrese Halliburton in actions because you get the dual benefit of either exhausting him or eventually he's going to mess it up. I don't think Tyrese Halliburton's a great defender. I don't think it's like he solved it. Oh no, let's forget about putting him in the actions now he's got our number no we could you keep putting Tyree Halliburton in actions you keep making him make difficult decisions and when the court is super spaced out we see the benefits that it's having for the Indiana Pacers they're completely destroying the Knicks on the offensive end and that is because there's nobody at the rim and we've seen you know Miles Turner attack a terrible Isaiah Hartenstein close out and get a monster dunk that's because there's no one else down there because they're spaced out um so I I I see the the negatives for sure 
but I also see the benefits. And I think it really comes down to this. Isaiah Hartenstein, uh, I believe in game five, had the best and most impactful game of his entire career. I believe that's what we saw from him in game five. Completely unstoppable, could not be kept off the offensive glass, could not be stopped when he was just muscling guys around. And then we saw the opposite in this game six. Isaiah Harnstein was awful. It was like a complete turnaround. It, 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 he's had a bizarre seesaw, which seems to correlate to home and, and away games in this series, like very severely. Um, and it's really unfortunate. But at the same time, I, I think that the Knicks don't win without a monster effort from Isaiah Hardenstein, regardless of what lineup that they have out there. Whether it's Precious at the four, whether it's Precious, Jericho Sims, and Hardenstein all out there together, it doesn't matter. If, if Hardenstein's not playing the way that he played in game six, all is lost, all is for nothing. And so to me, it, you need that Hardenstein if you're going to have a chance anyway, and that Hardenstein is going to be able to do some damage on the boards on his own. We saw that the Pacers had a ridiculous, ridiculous they had their way on the defensive glass. Um, defensively, they gave up an offensive, uh, a defensive rebound rate um, of 44%, which is completely absurd um, to be able to keep the Knicks off the glass that much. It's just completely ridiculous. Um, and I think that was largely due to Isaiah Hartenstein. I, I don't think that that's due to um, that's due to them being small with Josh Hart and other factors like that. I think that was because Isaiah Hardenstein really didn't show up very well. He wasn't good on both ends primarily. And uh, I, I think that that just needs to change regardless. So to me, that's the biggest thing. It's, it, it's this situation where there's not an adjustment. And I thought this late in you know game six like what's the adjustment there's no adjustment <laughs> this is the this is what you got this is these are the guys you got this is the best lineup you could put out there there's nothing you really you can go to you just have to make it work and to make it work isaiah hartenstein is the key piece he is the one that is going to allow their defensive strategy to work and then everything to fall into place around him so if you if isaiah hartenstein doesn't show up forget about whoever's at the four it's just irrelevant to me yeah i think i think you nailed it um We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little more game seven. We we've put it off long enough. We got to talk about Jalen Brunson's tough night and, and a really great, I mean, first half in particular, first quarter in particular for Deuce McBride. We'll get into all that next on Locked on Knicks. Passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships. The Knicks need to hear that right now is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, 116-103 loss for the New York Knicks in Indiana. Um, I, you, you're right on Hardenstein. Like, I'm, I'll, I'll just say that simply. Like, I was surprised the Knicks did not get more from him. And at a certain point, like, with him and with Brunson, like, I want to go back to the idea that, like, all right, it's dead legs. Like, it's it's too much. Like, they had three days off, and they both looked amazing in game five. Like, sometimes you you just don't play well. There isn't really an excuse. There isn't really an explanation, particularly for Hardenstein, whose game is just so effort-based. And he wasn't like, look, like defensively and, and rebounding-wise, like that's where he was a disaster. And I say that despite the fact he got three offensive rebounds in this game where it killed the Knicks is he had four defensive rebounds in 33 minutes, which is a stunning number for him, even in a game where the Pacers obviously shot exceptionally well from the field, making 54% of their shots. Um, all that led to a scenario where like, like plus Indiana not really turning the ball over. They flipped it from shooting 29 less shots than the Knicks to taking nine more shots than the Knicks. And that like the ball game can sometimes be as simple as that. Um, but Hartenstein, like he did do some good stuff offensively, like passing the basketball, setting some good screens, like hit that crazy foul line floater. Not a good game for him. It was certainly not a good game, despite what the final numbers said for Jalen Brunson finished with 31 and five on decent enough shooting, but a disastrous first half for him. Only five points in the first half. Misses 11 straight shots in the second quarter. That was the, I mentioned it earlier, but the longest um, missed shot streak of his entire career. 
I appreciated the, I mean, I hated it, but I guess from a, from a 50 million foot view appreciated the Pacers adjustments on, on, on Brunson, obviously Halliburton was much better in terms of doubling and, and then just quickly recovering, which is something that was just disastrous for Indiana in game five, where Halliburton would just linger on the ball. And the next got four and three after four and three, this time he showed, he got back. But what Indiana also mixed in is then when Brunson would say, great, you're bailing. Now I'm going to go one-on-one. They got all these rear view contests in the first half where Halliburton was chasing him behind. And, and at times they would crash like basically three or four guys in on Jalen Brunson and say, hey, you can give this basketball to literally anyone else. And in the first quarter, it felt like the Knicks were dictating that dance. And and Deuce McBride got another three off of a short roll. Like um, at times when Brunson missed, it led to broken plays where the Pacers were just packed in the paint around him. And Dante DiVincenzo got two early threes off those plays. And those were, those were big boons to the Knicks. And in the second quarter, they just kind of made the bet that Jalen Brunson is too laser focused on scoring. He's not a good enough passer. And the Knicks just don't have enough great options to really make us hurt for essentially committing our entire defense to stymieing him. And look, at, at times Brunson just missed some shots. But to me, it was mostly that he was trying to score on three guys and as incredible, as extraordinary as he is, like if you're going to put three guys, a lot of them way bigger than him, um, he's just not going to be able to score. What do you think the balance that he's going to have to strike in game seven between coming out and saying like, hey, if Josh is out too, now what? what is it, five or top seven are missing this game? Like, I just need to come out here and try and drop 50 versus like to your point, especially when the Knicks get that kind of spacing on the floor. I need to drive and figure out ways to get the ball back out to the perimeter if they're going to throw three guys on me. Yeah, I think I think this is the big reason that I think Alec Burks is going to matter a lot in this coming game. And and I think it's because of the way that the Pacers guarded Brunson. I think Brunson can be slow to adjust in a particular game, but he's really good at adjusting the following game. Um, we saw how the Pacers played it. They're like, Brunson's not going to beat us. <laughs> it's just that's just that simple. Uh, we don't really care who's on the court. They helped very liberally off of Josh Hart, essentially turning Josh Hart into the Precious Achua when Precious Achua wasn't on the court. And then when Precious was on the court, they helped liberally off Precious Chua. But to be honest, they helped off of everybody. They didn't care. They were going to not let Brunson get deep into the paint and get easy buckets. And they were mostly successful. <clears throat> um, Jalen Brunson scored a lot at the end, you know, when it didn't really matter very much and the game was kind of out of hand. Uh, but in that really critical second quarter, you mentioned it, missing 11 shots in a row. It was just that was kind of what put the game out of reach, although they had an opportunity to come back in the second half. It just it just wasn't going well. And so I think that the adjustment that Brunson needs to make is to look to get his teammates involved early, look to get guys going from the three point line. And if they do have a very spaced out court with shooters, you're going to have to trust Deuce McBride to make shots. You're going to have to trust Alec Burks to make shots. You're going to have to have to trust Dante DiVincenzo to make shots. And those guys are going to have to shoot really well. Luckily, 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 the Knicks are at home for that game, and these guys tend to shoot better at home, and so hopefully that's the case. But to me, it's just, yeah, Brunson has to be better, and hopefully he diagnoses what happened and, and comes back with a better game plan, which I think he will, and I think it'll be a pass-first situation. Yeah, I, I, th I think it has to be because it was it was a tale of two halves in the sense that, I mean, look, the, the Knicks were winning after the first quarter in this one. It's easy to forget that. But despite all the defensive issues and mo most of the plays I, I was listing off to start this podcast happened in the first quarter and the Knicks were able to survive because, I mean, Deuce McBride had one of the best quarters of his entire life. Like he, he had 13 points, I think, in the first and was just hitting three after three, like one of them on the short roll situations, one of them like off a great Hartenstein screen where he hit a step back. Like I think another off a offensive rebound, uh, it was off a deflected rebound that Dante tapped over to him, like had a coast to coast, like like pick off of a, of a DHO for a layup. But like he was pretty much silent. I think he had five points in the second half. Dante like hit that three at the buzzer then the first half, like he had only two points in the second half. So once Brunson got going, it felt like everyone else fell off and the Knicks were just not able to strike that balance between Jalen Brunson scoring and like everyone else working. And I unfortunately think like Josh Hart is not totally essential to that, but this is where like, I think it's going to be really hard for the Knicks to win. If he is either not playing or to your point, like the even worse scenario who's playing and not close to hundred percent. Like he is just such a, crucial connector and like over and over again this year obviously you see it in like 
in, in clear situations where Brunson's double teamed and he'll get off the ball and it's a four on three, but even like not in those situations, just when Brunson drives and kicks it out to him, like Hart is just so important to making that next pass. And I, I think Dante can do that. I think Deuce can do that to some extent. Obviously Hardenstein can get it. He's just rarely the outlet for Jalen because he's usually around the basket or around the foul line where the defense has already converged. Like, like that is kind of like, if I was to like crystallize my Josh Hart concern, not having him offensively beyond using, losing the offensive rebounds, beyond losing the transition buckets that are basically the, the only source of self-creation the Knicks have had in the playoffs outside of Jalen and outside the games where Dante's really feeling himself. Like that, that is where I zoom in and I see a major issue is that like Hart, might not be there to make those extra passes. He's not going to be there in transition. And you just lose a lot, obviously, from a rebounding perspective on both ends. Yeah, exactly. You're definitely going to lose that. And that's why you just need a monster performance from Isaiah Hardenstein. There's really no way around it. That's that's just what we're going to see. And to your point, you know, the Knicks did score pretty efficiently. You know, I'm looking at the game stats. Uh, they scored at a rate of 119 points per 100 possessions, which is really, really good. Um, but I will say this. You're going to have to outscore the Indiana Pacers. There's no way around it. In the games that the Knicks have won, they've actually surpassed that number. They've scored 124 per 100, 141 per 100, and 133 per 100. That's Those are the three games that they've won. So there's no way. 119 is not going to be sufficient to beat this team. You're not going to completely trounce them defensively. They're going to find a way to score. They're too well-spaced. They, they have too much firepower. They get in transition. You're going to have to score. Something that I really liked in the game for the Knicks early on was that they did score a lot in transition, but it feels like for the Knicks, they tried to either get that first transition attack and get a layup, and if not, then they'll wait to there's nine seconds left on the clock to get going. I think that's something that they'll have to adjust. I think they'll have to try to attack a little bit more early in the shot clock um, and, and see if they can get to different kinds of looks if the first look is not there and not kind of get up desperate heaves at the end. Those are kind of wasted possessions to me. Um, NBA offenses shoot way dramatically more uh, poorly in once they get to late shot clock situations. I think they got to get shots up earlier. The Pacers want them to get later shot clock opportunities. That's why they're bringing the, the pressure. They want the Knicks to cross the half court line with about 16 seconds left on the shot clock, knowing that if it's Jalen Brunson who brought it up, he's going to dribble it out to nine seconds. And then, then the offense gets going. They got to get things going a lot earlier, try to get better opportunities. If a, gr a good shot's not there, keep getting it around the horn until they get a great shot. So those are some adjustments they could make. And I know it looks like they had a decent offensive game, but from the records, they're going to need to have a great offensive game to have a chance to win this one. Yeah. I, I, I kind of want to see them set screens deep in the backcourt. And I think just from an energy perspective, the Knicks have been really reticent to do this, but they're like, it's game seven. Like whatever you've left in the tank just has to come out. Like they're going to have to push against pressure. Like, we the re, Indiana has not been punished. Like typically, the trade off for pressing is you might give up something in transition if that initial line gets beat. I mean, like just think about football, like press coverage, like you might get beat on a go route. And the Knicks have not even tried to punish that because just from an energy perspective, especially when Jalen Brunson is the guy bringing up 70, 80 percent of the time, like he doesn't have the juice to do everything he's doing in the half court and also be like, hey, Jalen, like sprint past the guy. So it's going to have to be Deuce McBride. It's going to have to be Dante DiVincenzo. It might even have to be Alec Burks and the, those old 32 year old younger than I thought legs um, at times like set a screen in the backcourt for a guy and you're just going to have to go and like try and get to the rim and put Indiana's defense in rotation because if, if you're trying to beat them to your point like pretty much only playing in the half court especially with no heart to just create those transition opportunities out of thin air like you're just not going to be as efficient as Indiana already a very efficient half court offense also having some of those possessions where they create trans transition out of nowhere. I love that point so much. I think that's such a great point. They have not been, the Pacers have not been punished for the pressure that they've been applying. Basically, the Knicks are just saying, okay, we don't like the pressure. We'll find a way to get it up the court and then we'll wait and let you reset your defense. <laughs> that's not a great, I mean, of course, Rick Carlos continues to put pressure on them every single possession. You have Obi yeah. Toppin. We talked about putting pressure on the Knicks coming up the court. Obi Toppin, you should be able to blow by him and create a five on four situation pretty easily. But the Knicks, they just want to get the ball up the court and then stop, you know, unless they have a real, real transition opportunity. There's no willingness to take advantage of the four five on four situation that you could create um, with a guy hounding your point guard up the court or whoever's bringing the ball up. So I think that's a great point. 
I think that that's something that the Knicks will have to do, punish the Pacers for the the pressure that they're applying. And like you said, if Josh Hart's not going to be there to make transition opportunities out of thin air, then you're going to have to generate some easier looks and you're not going to be able to rely on half court offense with 10 seconds left on the shot clock to reliably score what you need to score to win the game, which is probably going to be at an offensive rate of effectiveness of like 125 per 100 at, at a minimum. So to be able to do that, you're going to have to get easy looks and they're going to have to capitalize on some of the things that the Pacers are doing schematically. Look, we, we, we've said it. We'll, we'll end on it here. The Knicks are missing, uh, I think now five of their six highest paid players, like teams typically do not win game sevens in the second round of the playoffs, missing five of their six highest paid players. Um, it's going to be a test of, I mean, just, just how magical are these Knicks? And also like, does Indiana have it in them? Like I, I said it before, I'll say it one more time. I was, I was impressed with what they did in game six. Like I kind of thought like the Knicks had just gotten in their head and like game six was going to, like be closer because it was at home, but was going to go similar to how game five went because the Knicks were just the tougher team. And obviously Hart's injury played a role, but the Pacers like bounced back. Can they actually do it at MSG? They all maybe should have done it in game one. Outside of that, we haven't seen it from them. Um, the Knicks have, haven't let us down yet. And, and hopefully they don't now. Uh, he's XJ. I'm Gavin. We will have you covered after game seven on locked on Knicks.